Good afternoon. First, sorry about this delay. I hope it was not too inconvenient for you. Thank you very much to be with us again this year. This is, we are close to the uh, second year of this war. And um, I would like to ask you the first question, how do you assess uh, the Ukrainian counter-offensive? Uh, it is usually, as you know, not considered to be a great success. It is not a defeat either, but it is not a great success. I think it's important to have your assessment of the situation. Well, Ukraine's great successes on the battlefield uh, throughout the summer and autumn of 2022 raised the raised expectations that uh, every battle we will be fighting will be producing as impressive results as the counteroffensive in the east of Ukraine last year when we liberated um, Kharkiv region in, uh, uh, in an undoub undoubtedly impressive and striking uh, counteroffensive. Now, uh, this counteroffensive is, uh, is not as impressive as the previous one. And of course, expectations, uh, people feel uh, disappointed about it. But everything that has been achieved by our soldiers in this counteroffensive is an act of heroism. Because I cannot imagine another army in the world that would be able to break through the first lines of uh, the Russia of the defenses Russia built in the south uh, of Ukraine. This is very much very similar to the Second World War um, count, <clears throat> count operation uh, of uh, Allied operation in uh, on the Western Front. Um, the, there was the famous Siegfried Line built by Germany. Uh, Germ uh, Russia uh, built a very similar defensive lines. So it's not easy, um, but we still made uh, uh, good progress in the south. We, uh, we are approaching the city of Bakhmut in the east. And uh, we have to understand one thing. This is a war. And the war, it's not just one battle in a history book. It's a sequence of battles. And uh, we should not allow anyone to manipulate, to, to, to speculate that if one counteroffensive is less impressive than the other, then things uh, are going in the wrong direction. No, they are not. We are still uh, fighting and we are still uh, liberating our territory from Russian occupying forces. You uh, mentioned the Second World War. Doesn't it look more like the First World War? Or the end of the this is the perception. No, that's yeah, I, know the, that's I, know this, yeah. I know this debate and uh, it's interesting because uh, those who want to emphasize the point of the stalemate and certain impasse on the battlefield, they refer to the First World War and they compare current situation with the First World War. Those who want to emphasize temporary difficulties in uh, liberating territories, uh, and I belong to that camp very openly, um, they emphasize uh, the experience of the Second World War. So uh, I think it's rather more an intellectual debate and the point sides are trying to make. Because if, uh, you know, if I recall some of the op Allied operations in north of France, in the Netherlands, like the famous market garden operation, which was considered to be the, the, the counteroffensive uh, to end the Second World War and defeat Nazi Germany, it did not deliver. It was a failure, but uh, uh, still it was an important part of the overall um, fight against Nazi Germany. And in the end, um, Allied forces prevailed over Nazis. So, um, I really think it's part of the, I mean, this first, second world war comparison depends on the point, on a broader point you are trying to make about this war. That's uh, extremely interesting. But would you say the same 
uh, about the discussion, the question whether it will be a very long war or not, you know. Uh, would you say that those who forecast that uh, it will be a long, perhaps a very long war, do you say that they are just uh, following uh, behind the Russian propaganda? Well, I think that there is no room for deadlines when it comes to the fight for territorial integrity and sovereignty of any country. And um, no one is, uh, you know, if you are attacked on the street, um, you are not setting yours and you, you clearly see that the attacker is trying, has the intention of killing you. You are not telling to yourself, I'm going to fight for five minutes. But if I see that I'm failing, that I cannot beat him off, I will simply give up. Right. This is this is simply not how we neither people, persons nor states think. So uh, I want peace. Ukraine wants peace more than anyone else in the world, but um, not at the cost of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And just over the last night, uh, Ukraine was attacked with, I think, 36 Russian uh, drones and missiles. Um, they are um, undertaking uh, offensive operations in the east, in this, in the in the east of Ukraine, and this is not how you behave when you want peace. This is not how you behave when you want aggression, when you want to stop the war. So, um, to be honest with you, we are not making the timeline cal calculation. We are focused on. Uh, sorting out problems, uh, mobilizing support, ramping up production of uh, weapons, um, further increasing resilience of our economy. We will fight as long as it takes for Ukraine to win, because if Ukraine doesn't win, there will be no lasting peace. I'm, I'm in Berlin now, and I was reminded famous words by uh, Helmut Kohl, who once said, the end of war does not necessarily mean peace. And this is, this is something that uh, people should always remember while considering different options about the end of the war in Ukraine. We need the end of the war that will bring peace and not another war, uh, another aggression by Russia. And this is why the basis of this peace should be the peace formula proposed by Ukraine based on international law and UN Charter. But uh, would you say that the willingness of the uh, armed forces in Ukraine and the willing death of the people, and those who are behind the front, would you say that their determination to continue to fight is as strong as it was a few months ago? Well, uh, army is part of the society. And so am I. This war will continue as long as the people of Ukraine are ready to endure all kinds of hardships related to the war. And when I look at the most recent polls uh, taken, uh, conducted, I think in October and September and October this year, I recall that 73% of Ukrainians said that they categorically reject any kind of territorial concessions Ukraine should make in this war. And uh, more than 50%, 50 percent, 50 something, I think 56 or 58 percent of Ukrainians said that they are ready to endure hardships um, as long as it takes for Ukraine. So these are the numbers. This is what people say. And uh, we are a democracy. You can find different opinions, and it's true that you know we. Uh, it's extreme. It's it's difficult to fight this war, but the vast majority of Ukrainians believe in victory, and they believe that we are on the right course, and therefore we keep fighting. Of course, you understand that all the questions I am asking are the questions that everybody is uh, asking uh, in uh, France, in Europe, in the US, and, and everywhere. This is why I put this question. So one of them is that uh, normally uh, presidential uh, elections are scheduled uh, next year in uh, Ukraine. 
And uh, do uh, you have, uh, what can you say uh, uh, about these elections? Will they take place or not? Is it still a question to be debated? I was thinking of, uh, you know, when uh, the Turks uh, had this terrible earthquake uh, a few months ago, the question was, will uh, the elections uh, take place uh, in, in Turkey or not? So here, it's not an earthquake, it's worse than an earthquake, it's, it's a war. So what can we say uh, about that? We are a democracy. We went through many tests. Uh, sometimes uh, it seems that uh, uh, some friends are trying to turn Ukraine into the global laboratory of democratic tests. And I think there's no other country in the world that would be even considering holding elections against the background of such large scale um, invasion. Uh, but um, we are not closing this page. We, uh, the president of Ukraine is uh, considering and weigh, weighing different, uh, different uh, pros and cons. But it's not because he uh, he's unwilling to to hold elections. Uh, it's because holding these elections under current circumstances will require an unprecedented effort and will require to address unprecedented challenges. And I can name a few of them. As foreign minister, I will be in charge of Ukrainians voting abroad. Now, if we estimate uh, that between five and eight million Ukrainians uh, are currently residing in foreign countries, with uh, some countries, uh, some countries host like one from one to two million Ukrainians, it simply means that uh, the whole country where they reside will have to be covered with um, polling stations. And many countries simply do not allow holding uh, foreign elections outside of the diplomatic missions of a country that is holding elections. How do I address this challenge? Um, if I go back to Ukraine, uh, how to conduct, how to ensure that polling stations will not become perfect targets for Russian missiles and drones? because people will go to vote. Everyone will know where polling station is. How will soldiers in the trenches vote? I do not mean the, cha the, the choice they're going to make. I mean, technically. Uh, and the more, very important point, how will people in the temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine vote? So, um, these are the challenges that need to be addressed. But I'm not saying no to the, to the idea of election, saying that this is something that needs to be addressed. And second, that uh, we are a democracy and we want to uh, develop, further develop as a strong democratic country. But we also ask uh, to understand the difficulties, uh, enormous difficulties that the country is, change, is, is facing at this point. So uh, it's not only in Ukraine that uh, uh, major elections are supposed to take place uh, next year. Uh, the most important uh, country uh, for the world but there is certainly the US. So are you worried uh, about uh, the uh, prospects of the uh, presidential elections in the US? Uh, the Republican, Republicans in particular seem to be more and more divided on the issue of supporting uh, Ukraine. Uh, even in the Democratic Party, it's not totally uh, uh, clear. So could you uh, tell us uh, a little bit uh, how you, what is your assessment of the, uh, if I may say so, the American risk? Well, to be honest, uh, the only thing I really worry about is <clears throat> the the health of my children, of my parents, and uh, everything else is just part of the job. Uh, after everything that has happened to Ukraine, I really don't worry about anything. If we, every time we face a greater challenge than the one that we faced yesterday, uh, we just have to double or triple our efforts to, to overcome it. 
uh, we are a year uh, ahead of the U.S. elections. And frankly speaking, um, I understand the dynamics of the electoral campaign. And uh, the closer we get to the elections, the more uh, tense the debate will be. That's clear. And we understand that Ukraine will be one of the issues at the center of the, uh, of the debate. But um, frankly, I think we will, you know, we will cross the bridge when we come to it. So at this point, we are focused on another on another issue, which is uh, the decision by the Congress that need to be taken on allocating sufficient resources to support Ukraine throughout 2024. So this is something that we are working on. I think uh, starting early next year, we will be getting more focused on handling uh, uh, the uh, right positioning of Ukraine in light of the internal debate in the United States. States. The world is full of risks, but if you want to win, if you want to succeed, you have to accept it as a fact. And you don't. What, what you should not allow yourself to do is to be afraid of any kind of risks. That's uh, obviously a very good answer. Uh, what about the Europeans? Uh, in uh, December, the EU leaders are supposed to uh, decide whether to open uh, negotiations, uh, access negotiations to the uh, EU with Kiev. Uh, but uh, we have observed in the last few months uh, events that many of us would not have anticipated in Europe. The Poland uh, incident, uh, about uh, corn, but they say that it, is, it was related to uh, the uh, election process. Now uh, the results of the elections in Poland, of course, are recomforting, uh, but uh, there are some uh, difficulties in Hungary. Uh, the result, the elections in Slovakia were also probably disappointing. So, uh, do you think uh, that uh, the uh, EU, the Europeans, uh, are a reliable partner for Ukraine? Uh, yes, because uh, we are all Europeans. And uh, EU uh, realizes that its security and prosperity depends on what is happening in Ukraine and on the outcome of uh, the war in Ukraine and on the future membership of Ukraine in the EU. Uh, of course, we all feel uh, tempted to uh, judge books by, by their covers, right? Uh, and politic in politics, the, the statements, the headlines that we see in the, in the, in the papers coming from different political forces, uh, they next year a lot of uh, emotional discussions and emotional reactions. But uh, we have to judge these countries by the decisions they make. And as long as we see the decisions related to Ukraine's accession to the EU, decisions um, related to the continuation of macrofinancial support of Ukraine, decisions uh, related to the provision of military support and imposing of sanctions against Russia are taken, we, everything else is politics. And we can, we can find the, the way to steer through these debates and political agendas that countries are having. Um, therefore, and we will, have, we will have a couple of these decisions by the end of the year to be adopted by the European Union. And we will see how countries, uh, how some members will uh, handle these situations. Uh, as of now, I th we, are, we are working very diligently, carefully, and with full respect to domestic political situations in, a number, in some European countries to make these decisions happen. And um, I, I think, more broadly speaking, uh, the role of the European Union in supporting Ukraine in this war is underestimated. And we should speak more about the unprecedented decisions that the European Union has made since last, since last February uh, to uh, defend Europe. Uh, because by, by helping Ukraine, EU helps to defend whole Europe. 
and we should we should be more out we 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 all should be more outspoken about that of course this uh, issue is related to the nato uh, issue uh, is it uh, from your viewpoint is it conceivable that uh, ukraine becomes a member of nato while the war is still going on Well, NATO membership cannot stop this war, but NATO membership for Ukraine will prevent further wars. So in this sense, there is no alternative to Ukraine's membership in NATO. Uh, the message that was sent uh, to the world and to Ukraine at the NATO Vilnius summit was very clear. Uh, Ukraine, Ukraine will become a member of NATO when security um, conditions allow. So um, a country uh, will, in an active phase of the conflict, of, the, of an armed conflict, of course, cannot be integrated into NATO. Uh, but um, as long as NATO is keeping the door open, as long as we see that NATO is not just keeping the door open, but also makes specific effort to increase interoperability and bring Ukraine closer. Um, that will be a pro, pro, uh, process moving in the right direction. Now, uh, so far, we have spoken uh, as if our meeting had taken place before the 7th of October. But on the 7th of October, something happened which maybe changed the whole game. Uh, since the Hamas uh, aggression in Israel on the 7th of October, uh, in the West in particular, one hardly speaks of what is going on in Ukraine, uh, as if uh, the, uh, the, the war had disappeared from the uh, front pages of the, of the newspapers. So, uh, are you? Uh, wh how? What is your assessment of the impact of the Middle East uh, war, uh, which has started and which also probably will be quite long? Uh, what is your assessment of its uh, consequences on the uh, Ukraine war? Well, we did disappear from the front pages but we did not disappear from the radars of uh, world politics. And uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty clear to me uh, because we are in constant communication with our partners in the United States and in Europe and other parts of the world. So uh, these are two different, two different kind of uh, areas and they have to be, uh, they have to be this, this has to be taken uh, into account. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but uh, the longer the war in the Middle East lasts, the less front pages it will uh, occupy as well, because this is the law of the world. People get used to it. People get used to wars, to disasters, uh, we even pandemics uh, as, as humanity. So. <clears throat> Uh, what brings you back to the to the front page is either is something big, uh, something uh, that uh, runs out of um, uh, that goes beyond people's you know people's routine perception of the conflict. For example, you know every day, all every day, Ukraine is being attacked massively with, Ukraine, with Russian drones and missiles. Um, the fact that this massive destruction and killing is not making to the front pages of the world is not our problem. It's the problem of readers and viewers who are not interested in the topic anymore. But the war continues and we are fighting it. But you, if you want to get back to the, to the front page, you have to you have to secure a big victory or you have to suffer a big loss. Then you make it back. Of course, we are working hard today to return to the front pages with a big, uh, big victory. Uh, speaking about trends, um, 
of course, if the conflict in um, we currently do not see any decrease in the support that we are receiving from partners because of the war in the Middle East. But the challenge, of course, there will be a different challenge if the conflict in the Middle East spillovers and uh, uh, takes it to the next level of violence and involvement of other players. And this is the risk that uh, needs to be permanently kept uh, in mind while assessing the dynamics of the process. But the challenge uh, goes beyond that. It's also related to the so-called Global South. And uh, with the new war in the Middle East, uh, the uh, hostility, uh, to, use, uh, to use that word, of the Global South uh, against the West uh, involves both uh, Ukraine and, uh, and Israel. Uh, so uh, that might have, nobody knows exactly, but it might have a serious uh, impact on, uh, over the, the, the years. Uh, in, in a world, how do you see this uh, issue? Well, <laughs> I, um, I see that countries who spent many months seeking arguments to explain why they are not supporting openly Ukraine in its fight against the Russian aggression are the loudest today in uh, accusing the West of double standards in the treatment of uh, Middle East, of the war in the Middle East and Ukraine. Because finally they, they, they tried to make the point, finally they got, um, they, they, they believe they found an excuse to explain why they behaved one way and not another towards Ukraine. Um, I don't think, I don't have the impression that uh, the, the Global South is lost. We recently held a meeting of the peace formula, proposed uh, a coordination meeting of the countries who were taking part in the peace formula proposed by President Zelensky. It was held in Malta. And um, the, last, the previous time we held the meeting in Saudi Arabia two months ago, we had 44 participants. This time in Malta, against the raging war in the Middle East, we had 66. And we see that many of the newcomers are coming from beyond the West. Uh, we had Arab countries, we had African countries, we had South American countries. Um, and third, of course, there will always be speculations about, uh, I think the, the, the double standard, con stand the conversation about double standards is the most uh, famous discussion in world affairs and in diplomacy. So there will always be those who will try to um, uh, reinforce this thing and accuse Ukraine or the West of some of, of, mis, um, of uh, mistreating uh, the Middle East conflict. And Russia will be re is, re is and will be reinforcing these messages because it perfectly fits their narrative. But I think the picture is far more nuanced than just uh, black and white. You know, you lost, you gained. Um, it's far more nuanced and it's not as dramatic, as critical, uh, and the situation is not as critical as it may seem. Well, I hope that in a year from now we will have a third uh, meeting of this kind with you, and perhaps even before, if you have a chance to, to go to Paris, I would be extremely honored to welcome you at IFRI. But my last question will be, uh, <coughs> Is there, from your viewpoint, any chance to have some kind of negotiations with Russia starting before uh, we meet next time? You know, um, <clears throat> people who are asking this question and I know that you were just, as you, as you mentioned before, you were asking me this question because this, this is floating in, in the air in, in uh, some places in the world. But I encourage everyone who is talking about uh, negotiations to learn history 
and you don't have to go too deep into history books. It's a very recent history. In between 2014, when Russia illegally annexed Crimea, and February 2022, when Russia launched its large-scale invasion against Ukraine, there were about 200 rounds of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia, mediated by Germany and France as part, as participants of the Normandy format, um, supported by the United States in one way or another, almost 200 rounds. 20 ceasefires were officially announced in the same period of time, and all of them were violated by Russia. So the question to everyone entertaining the idea of how nice it would be to have negotiations should ask, should first ask himself or herself, what makes me believe that Russia changed for the good since then? That this Russia can be trusted more than the one that uh, treacherously launched of the war instead of seeking diplomatic solution that the country that violated all ceasefires it signed up for. And once you answer this question in an honest way, there will be no questions about when will negotiations begin. And second, um, no one wants peace more than us, but we don't need a peace that will lead to another war. We need a peace that will be lasting. And when I see a daily morning report about the situation on the front line, I don't see the slightest indication that Russia is interested in peace, that Russia is seeking solutions. They're sending more weapons to more soldiers, more missiles, more drones. They want to fight. And sometimes we have to accept this is the reality. Sometimes there are moments in history when you have to defeat the evil on the battlefield before sitting down at the table and signing papers. This is the reality. And this is what Ukraine is doing. And instead of uh, uh, crying uh, for out for negotiations, I want everyone to focus on, on a different question. How can I help Ukraine to win on the battlefield and to put Ukraine in the best position to negotiate and to put an end to this war? When you change these optics, when you start asking yourself realistic questions, then this war will end rather sooner than later. Otherwise, it's just an empty, empty. There is this uh, word in, in Germany, uh, uh, lumpen, 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 lumpen peace or something like, you know, misconception of peace or hypocritical understanding of what real peace is. So let's work towards real peace and not hypocritical uh, peace that will lead to another war. Well, Mr. Minister, thank you very much. The time is up. I would like to thank you again uh, for uh, everything you told us. I, uh, you know that uh, all of us uh, in uh, Europe and beyond uh, admire the extraordinary resistance of uh, your people and the way uh, Ukraine fight to become a long-lasting nation. So, um, again, we admire you, and uh, I wish you personally and uh, your country uh, all the best. And uh, thank you to have uh, uh, taken uh, a moment of your precious time for this uh, discussion with us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for this conversation.